Uh, things that we're seeing out there. Let me know if everybody can see my screen okay. Let me get this into presentation mode. How's that working? Are we? Good. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So uh, it's interesting that some of the, I get asked a lot, what are the top risks facing enterprises today? And I think we could all look at this and, and break this down to these in some form or fashion uh, are probably in all likelihood in, in your one, two, or three in some order. Certainly data breaches have, have been in the news like crazy. Uh, we as humans don't know how to handle our data very well. If we look at the Verizon data breach investigation report, 85% of all data breaches involve some sort of human element or interaction. What's interesting is 61% uh, of breaches involve credentials and in fact, credentials and personal data are now the two most sought after data types. And when we start talking about other threats to the world out there, like ransomware, like exploiting vulnerabilities and, and hacking uh, you know, humans and social engineering and those sorts of things, it makes a ton of sense that credentials and personal data are super valuable because it helps you not just move laterally, but also remain more sticky in the environment and do more damage as an attacker. Uh, we've all heard the news about ransomware. Uh, I I'm sure Mark's gonna jump into some of this as well. I don't wanna belabor this point, but the other piece of this is really around business email compromise. So uh, oftentimes in security world, and I've been an analyst in a past life, I've worked for security vendors, and now work for one again, we get caught up on a lot of times in shiny toy syndrome. Well, how do you solve a problem like business email compromise where you don't have a link, you don't have an attachment. So the value of the tool uh, or the tooling that you look to use is somewhat diminished. You've got to start training your people. You've got to do the, the hard things. Uh, you've got to understand as IT people and infosec people, how does our organization take money? How do we exchange money? How do we wire funds to other people? How do business partnerships work? All those things that might seem outside of the realm of what we might do as an information security engineer or security architect, we've got to think through a lot of those use cases and outcomes, and we've got to start getting better at that. The simple fact of the matter, like I mentioned, 61% of all breaches from Verizon involve credentials. And this is really, uh, the fact of the matter is attackers don't hack in anymore. They log in. Only 3% of the uh, breaches that Verizon profiled last year involved active exploitation of a vulnerability. It means 97% of them didn't. And some of the ways that they're looking to log in now uh, are using things like corporate credential phishing. They're relying on users in almost all cases to run code for you. Uh, so they're not, it's, it's no longer the day of let me go own a machine, take it over and then stage. It's let me go get something to somebody in some way or another, even something as silly as a business email compromise email. Again, no link, no attachment. Let me do something like impersonate somebody's support help desk and get them to call somebody and have them manually type something into a browser. Uh, it's dumb stuff like this that is still working. I've, we focus a lot on insider threat management here at Proofpoint. We've got a whole part of our business dedicated to this. And one of the interesting things I wanted to share with this group is some of the top 10 alerts that we saw in a, in a pre-COVID world versus this world that we live in now, where we're all remote, we're all sitting on Zoom calls, trying to figure out how to mute and unmute ourselves and turn cameras on and off. And some of these are pretty obvious. Like it, as we move to that remote world, you know, we started sharing uh, more content. We started moving large files around. We started attaching things like printers and scanners and USB drives to our system so that we could get our jobs done. But many users also started looking for ways to get around some of the systems. How do I bypass some of the IT controls that are on my endpoint? How do I try to shut down some of the agent software that's running? Or I see a lot of things in my system tray. How do I, how do I go about uh, you know, cleaning some things up? And this work from anywhere world really accelerated the people-centric risks that we see out there. Uh, even in our own environment, uh, we've seen almost 60 million messages that are hosted in Office 365 that are malicious. And we've seen over two and a half million compromised accounts from our own threat data. And, and what's interesting here is that this then carries over into other parts of the threat landscape, certainly things like supplier risk and third party risk to other people hold themselves to the same security standards we do. And obviously there's a huge insider threat management pro uh, problem out there with careless users and compromised users. And then it's a minority of the case, but the truly malicious people that are out there trying to do bad things. One of those new kinds of attacks 
that we're seeing out there uh, are things that look like they're coming from your SharePoint account. So using things like reputation filtering, uh, keying off of domains and things like that, you can't just simply block SharePoint online. Uh, dot com. You can't block Outlook.com or Office.com, but there's a lot of things that are out there using things to impersonate Office 365. They're authenticating to legitimate Azure ADs, and voila, you go grab a spreadsheet that's got macro enabled, and you've got malware on a box all of a sudden. So it's really the rise in things like uh, OAuth applications and OAuth misuse uh, is a huge problem that we're going to deal with. Talked about social engineering, the fact that a lot of people are relying on users to run their code for them or get credentials for them. Uh, and ransomware attacks, something, uh, ransomware is, again, one of those problems that we've seen a lot. Uh, I'm going to build this out really quickly and just for the sake of uh, belaboring the obvious, uh, even Palo Alto Networks, one of our partners, called out the fact that 75% of all ransomware attacks end up starting with that phishing uh, presence. So it's a credential fish. Uh, it's some sort of uh, link or payload driven uh, message or attachment that comes through. But if you look to the ransomware initial access point, how this all got started, uh, it's, it typically starts with that fish. It starts with that message. Uh, there's a number of things that we can do to help you both on the preventative side. So if, if we take this uh, shift left approach. So uh, we're very focused as an industry now on detection response, which is great. We want to focus on those for the things that we really need to investigate. We can't forget about the prevention side of this equation. There's a lot of things that we can do on the front end to stop uh, these kinds of threats from ever getting there in the first place. And even when those things get delivered, again, 75% of the time, according to email or, or according to Paolo uh, via email, there's things like browser isolation that we can utilize. There's automation capabilities that we can go uh, limit the amount of systems that are covered for, for malware. Uh, one final thought I'd like to leave you with before I hand this over to Mark is thinking about this from a people-centric point of view. Instead of throwing technology at all these different problems, whether we're talking about BEC or ransomware uh, or, or data security, Think about what people look like in your environment. How are they risky? Who are the people that are, are likely to be vulnerable? Who are the people that might have a high degree of maybe public exposure uh, and might be attacked? And who are the people that have a lot of privileges? We, we talk about least privilege a lot, but in many organizations, we really don't uh, live up to uh, how we're talking. We, we don't think about that. One of the things we've done uh, here at Proofpoint is we have a free dashboard for any of our customers that have our bundles where they can actually dig in and answer some of those questions. Like who are my riskiest people? Uh, what makes them so risky? And I can look at people that might be very vulnerable, uh, very attacked and or very privileged. And those might be at the center of that Venn diagram. Uh, so if I have 20,000 people in my organization sample uh, set, who are the people that meet all those conditions? Who are the people that are those imminent targets? And let me focus on those 21 people to try to really understand those most at risk uh, from the widest amount of, of uh, vectors, what can we do to help them? Again, we've got some other great things as part of our solution, uh, unified alert management, being able to pull in, not just looking at the email channel, not just looking at the cloud channel or the endpoint channel or the web security channel, but really putting this all in one place so that we can get a unified view uh, of threats and what's going on in the environment. So. You know, again, Proofpoint's been on this multi-year journey to build out this people-centric platform, to really focus on that number one threat vector of email, uh, but branching out to then protect people and then protecting all the different things that we access. So I'm going to hand it over to Mark. That was kind of a quick uh, elevator pitch. I realize I'm standing between everybody and two bottles of booze. So uh, Mark, go for it. And I'll stop sharing. Nice. Actually, Ryan, I'm the one standing between two bottles of whiskey. <laughs> It's not you. So I'm, I'm in the precarious go. position. So uh, no, good, good stuff. So I'm going to make this really quick. And I'm actually, it was funny, as I was putting this together, I'm like, I'm going to cause more people to drink. So here I go. So you guys see, you guys see my slide, right? So my goal, right? So by the way, just quick introductions. Uh, you know, thanks, Kate, for an awesome introduction. Um, I will tell you that since Thursday, my life's been consumed by Log4J which I'm sure many of you are, are in the same boat. So this, these, two, these two beautiful bottles of whiskey will come in very handy. Um, my goal even before this, this log for j thing was just to kind of go over the last 20 years uh, really quickly, like in three slides. 
and just talk about like how quickly, you know, things have changed. You know, I would have thought that last year with being the height of the pandemic would be the year that I we would see the largest number of attacks and the largest number of vulnerabilities. But here we are sitting literally a year later, maybe days since the SolarWinds attack, and we have 40% more attacks weekly. So <laughs> it's not getting any better. Um, this is just a good depiction just to kind of show how increased the number of vulnerabilities were even prior to the last handful of years. Um, and we can have lots of reasons to attribute this to. So we can, we can blame cloud, we can blame you know, mobile devices, we can blame IoT. But I really think that this slide really depicts really what we're going against. So many of us remember 2004, um, you know, look at the, so by the way, every little one of these dots represents um, a breach where over 30,000 records were compromised. So the larger the circle, you can see the larger the number is. So, you know, AOL, you know, 92, million um, uh, records and you can see some of the smaller ones and you, and you can't quite make out the the name but this is 2004 to 2007 so let's look at the the last four years and again these dots represent a, a leak of over 30,000 records and you can see that it's a much bigger and dire story so this is what it's all about right so we talk about you know what even what Brian was talking about how email security is the is the biggest uh, you know, you know, entry point for a lot of malware. It's absolutely true. Um, I couldn't agree more. Um, but then we have events like the last four days, which really, again, transform how we look at breaches and how we, 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 we need to defend against them. So if we just look backwards, and then I told you I was going to make everybody on this phone call or everybody on the Zoom uh, drink more. This is last year, right? And we thought, again, you know, we thought that, you know, maybe, maybe SolarWinds breach was something um, that we would never forget. And we probably don't even know the full extent of, of how bad that particular event is still today. We might have even thought that the exchange event with the CVA, CVE score of 9.8, um, maybe what is probably one of the, the most uh, impactful events even you know this year. So, but you can see that the number of these, these, these events are not going away. And, and you know, some are ransomware, some are more nation state attacking, some are more just software vulnerabilities uh, and things of that nature. So again, painting a really dire picture, making us thirsty. This is really what makes actually cybersecurity really interesting and really, really solidifies why you need the best security um, and, you know, the best um, prevention technologies out there, because this is what we have to deal with literally on a daily basis. So kind of wrapping it up, you know, I talked about how you know, there's been a 40% increase um, just, you know, you know, weekly from last year. And really every industry is targeted. And Log4j is a perfect example of that, right? We've got reports of Minecraft being one of the biggest spreaders of a potential new flavor of ransomware. Um, and, you know, how many of us um, have, you know, uh, family members and, and, and kids who, who are playing Minecraft regularly? And hopefully, we, you know, everything's patched and, and there's no compromise, but you can see how, it really doesn't matter whether you're a government, military, uh, organizational, education, corporate, manufacturing, it, 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 everybody is, you know, is, is, is being targeted. And one thing I like to highlight as well that, that is that cryptocurrency, not only being the currency of, of ransom, but cryptocurrency as it becomes more and more influential in our market, just in general, um, financial market is becoming a huge um, a magnet for attacks, whether it's attacking wallets, hijacking you know, ads like we like we had some research that we did um, or in this case with log4j really the first exploits that were in the wild were, were installing crypto miners on compromised machines so again it it, it all interconnects and it, it sort of unfortunately you know makes makes a lot of sense so i'm going to end it with this slide and and, and kate I'll, I'll pass it back to you but this is what i was talking about right retrospectively looking back um, at the exchange uh, um, uh, ex exploit um, earlier this year with a severity CV, CVS score, CVVS score of 9.8. You can see where it was reported, early exploits, right? Patches being released. And then, you know, ransomware several months later, um, you know, being, you know, hitting, hitting the, the um, you know, sort of the, 
I guess the infrastructures that we all support day to day. And you can see that, you know, from the first attack, you know, it was three weeks before the ransomware was deployed. So let's look at Log4j, and, and, and I'm happy to answer as many questions as we have relative to this. We have some decent data we can share, um, but you can see here that the severity score is even higher, right? 10 out of 10. And remember that the, the, the score, these scores are not only based upon uh, how impactful they can be, but how easy they can be uh, exploited. In this particular case, the reason why you get 10 for 10 for many, many reasons is that there are over 400 downloads of this particular library um, from GitHub. So it's a huge uh, install base. Everybody, quote unquote, is using it. And the exploit is very simple. So that's what's going to raise that critical severity score. Um, and you can see that it was reported on the 28th. Early exploits not that long ago on December 1st. Patches were released um, you know, on the 9th. And, but, you, but you see the biggest difference here is is that you know the the first attack and the it, it, everything is getting condensed right the ransomware you know when this slide was built um you know wasn't even ran, you know wasn't really correlate quite there was not much evidence of it so far but here we are just you know several days afterwards and we're getting reports that um not only there has it been nation state hacking but there's also been um uh, ransom being being uh, deployed as as a as a in the wild as payload so you can see how that three weeks is most likely going to shrink uh, even shorter. And that's that's really what we're dealing with. And, um, you know, I think if we look at the future couple weeks, month, you know, depending upon how impactful this will be, uh, the story is just going to get more and more interesting. And um, so that's that's what I have prepared. And, and I'm happy um, to take any questions um, that anybody has relative to log4j or, or just, uh, you know, cybersecurity in general. But, you know, the, the good news is, you know, and I could like to end it on good news is the good news is there's a lot of things that can be done to put ourselves in good situations, right? So, you know, we can, pre we can prevent um, a lot of these attacks, even day zero with machine learning. And, and we were able to prove that ourselves within Checkpoint, uh, being able to react quickly and being able to put packages out there to prevent, um, you know, these attacks before things could be patched. And in general speaking, right, the, the community in general responded really quickly with a way to, to prevent uh, these things from happening and patching software and so forth. So there's some good news, um, but I think, you know, the, one of the biggest issues tends to be is that vulnerability window for folks who don't patch, right? And now here we are sitting several days after the first exploit, and we know that things aren't patched. So that vulnerability window is growing, and the number of servers that are not and applications that aren't being patched are still remaining to be out there. And that's exactly what we hear about reported wise of, of already uh, ransomware and, and vulnerable hosts being going to the highest bidder on some of the some of the uh, some of the networks on the back end uh, looking to make more make further exploits. So I guess with that, I'll hand it back and uh, it should make us thirsty because it's uh, not a great picture that I'm painting. But at the same time. Again, with the right tools and the right partners and the, like Atlantic data, um, you know, we can we can make a big difference and prevent these attacks and, and put you guys in a much better situation from a cybersecurity perspective. So, Mark and Kate, I'll uh, I'll, I'll lob it back to you.